Hello everyone, it's Damo. As some may know, I was arrested almost a year ago to the day in Manchester, New Hampshire for chalking the police. ID, sir? Any ID? Do you have any ID with you? You don't have any ID? Don't talk to the police. Don't go away, sir. That's a lawful order. Okay, under arrest. Damo's under arrest! Let's go. Since the arrest, I've had a trial by judge in Manchester District Court. And at the conclusion of that trial, I was found guilty of criminal mischief and two counts of resisting arrest. My sentence was a $1,200 fine and one year in jail for each of my resisting arrest charges. The judge stayed $1,000 of my fine and 10 months of my jail time, noting that the resisting charge could be served concurrently, meaning that I'd serve two months now and the remaining 10 months if I broke any laws in the next two years. I appealed this decision to the Superior Court where I would receive a jury trial. On April 18th, I was summoned for a final pretrial hearing. I knew this hearing was primarily to determine the trial date, and since I hadn't filed or objected to any motions, I sought to skip the long travel to Manchester. I called the district attorney, Kathleen Broderick, and left a message. She later called me back and said I was required by the court to attend and reminded me of the punishment I'd face for failure to appear. So I went to the hearing, and with the typical government efficiency, the court was unable to set a date for my trial while I was present. In fact, Judge Brown told me that the court would call me next week to set the date. Two weeks passed and I had heard nothing from the court. Figuring it was business as usual for the court, I went upon my daily activities until a letter came um, in the mail. The resisting, I had a, a hearing and they were gonna call me and tell me when my jury selection would be and then send me a letter uh, reflecting such phone call. I did not receive one and now today is May 11th and I received this letter in the mail today telling me I have missed jury selection and that my bail has been forfeited and I must go to court. So I don't know what will happen. There's probably a, a small chance possibly that there's a warrant out for my arrest. Um, but this is the system. They did not call me. They did not write me a letter and I'm hoping to make it till Monday in order to tell them that that was the case and get this reopened. You know, I've never missed any other court date. I've been begging for a trial in this shocking incident with the jury since it happened and uh, hopefully that'll still happen because that's absolutely what I want. I want to be able to speak the truth to a jury and not to some uh, shady, unjust system of law. So just an update. Hopefully I'll stay free this weekend and I'll update more as I can. Thanks. Following the receipt of that letter, I went to the Superior Court in Manchester to investigate why I was never notified of my jury selection and trial. It turns out that those working to jail me sent the mail to an address that I've never had. Because even though my address has stayed the same all year, the state has continually been sending me mail to random past addresses of mine, and now one that doesn't even exist, according to Google Maps. To top it off, before taking the picture you just seen, I took the letter that was returned out of the envelope, and it bore the correct address at the top. Clear proof that this was nothing more than a clerical error. Having identified this error, I decided to file two motions one with the Superior Court and the other with District. In the motions, I pointed out that the mail was sent to a place I've never lived and that I never have or would miss a trial or court date. Of course, the state objected to my motion. According to the judge's ruling, my motion was denied because of paragraphs 2, 3, 5, 8, 9, and 11. On top of looking at those, I'll be adding paragraph number 6 as it embears important facts as well. Not having read the objection when it arrived in the mail, which was sent to my correct address, I decided to see what the judge found so worthy that he would then deny my motion. Starting with paragraph 2 and 3, Catherine Broderick states, During the pendency of said appeal, June 6, 2011, Manchester District Court bail ordered remained in full force and effect. In pertinent part, the bail ordered required the defendant to advise the court in writing of all changes of address within 24 hours. The defendant signed this document acknowledging receipt of the release conditions and penalties. She goes on to say in paragraph 3, Furthermore, the defendant signed a personal reconnaissance bond. The bond again reminded the defendant that he shall immediately notify any New Hampshire court in which this case is pending of any change of address. The defendant signed this document acknowledging receipt of this document. What Ms. Broderick fails to mention is that all these documents she states that I signed were done so under duress. I would have remained in a jail cell had I not signed their initial paperwork agreeing to their terms. And what kind of agreement is that? Sounds like something the Mafia said to people. Sign this or else. Aside from this, Ms. Broderick negates both paragraphs 2 and 3 with her statement in paragraph 5, where she states, 
On January 30th, 2012, the defendant filed his appearance with the Hillsborough County Superior Court North and listed his address as 75 Levis Street, Keene, New Hampshire. The defendant hereby notified the court of his change in address. So what's her complaint? I did what they asked. Of course, it was under duress because they threatened to take me to jail if I don't. But either way, I did change my address and I did it properly. Something she also failed to mention at this point is that my April 18th hearing was verbally relayed to me in the courtroom at my previous February hearing. Yet, this is where the problems start to go severely wrong. According to paragraph 6, on or about February 28, 2012, Hillsbury County Superior Court North sent notice to all parties that the trial management conference was scheduled for April 18th at 1.30 p.m. Jury selection was scheduled for April 30th at 9 a.m., and jury trial was scheduled for the week of April 30th. All of these dates were contained on the same hearing notice. Well, this may be true, except there are two problems with this statement. One, I never got the February 28th packet. And Ms. Broderick points that out in paragraph 8, page 2. According to the court's file, the February 28th hearing notice was sent to the defendant's 75 Leverage Street address. However, it appears that the mail was returned because the defendant has changed his address without notifying the court. Hi, when I went on February 28th, uh, let me check your address. Excuse me, what, you said it was the 28th? Yes, when I was February 28th. Oh, okay. What's your address? It's 75 Leverage Street. Okay, but what went out the 28th? A hearing notice. Oh, okay, great. Do you, do you know when that is, though? Just in case I don't get it. 4-18-12 at 1-30. So it's 4 18 12 one thirty, and that's just a hearing? It's not my actual trial? Trial management conference is what it's called. Okay. All right, is that it? That, right. yeah, well, I was also wondering about my felony wiretapping charges. Um, I, the last I Nonetheless, the one. clerk's officer resent the February 28th hearing notice to what appeared to be his new address located at 47 Schultz Street. According to the Hillsborough Superior Court files, the defendant's notice was returned. The second problem is that even if I had received the packet, I was still told on April 18th that no date can be given to me at the time. During my final trial management conference, something that Ms. Broderick states in paragraph 11, I was told that the court told the defendant that he would let the parties know by Monday, April 23rd, 2012, when the actual trial was scheduled. And with that, it's pretty clear to see. I was told of my April 18th court date while at my February court date, which is why I still knew about it without getting mail sent to me in between. What's unclear is why the court changed my address without me doing so personally. And if I had changed my address, why didn't she state it in her objection? Also, I'm currently facing 21 years in prison for a separate charge in the same courthouse, yet they have no problem mailing me their court paperwork. I'd also like to remind you of something I said earlier in the video, that the envelope, which bear my wrong and incorrect address, the letter itself inside the envelope contained my correct 75 Leverage Street address. I would have taken a picture of that paperwork, but I was scolded by co courtroom employees for removing paperwork from my file and was told that I could only photograph the outside envelope. Maybe something else Ms. Broderick can tell me is why the jury selection letter was mailed to the wrong address, but the letter informing me that I missed my trial was sent to the correct one. Right now, it seems I'll have to wait for an appeal or for the court to do what's right. Maybe Ms. Broderick herself will do what's right after seeing this video. Or maybe you, the viewer, can call Kathleen and encourage her to do what's right. I know I'll be calling some people on Monday morning, and I thank you for your time. As always, I'm a demo, and remember, badges, robes, or fancy degrees do not grant you extra rights.